10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have liftoff. So what caused SpaceX's Starship to explode? We're going to get into that today. We have live footage of the explosion from right beneath it, from a boat. Let's check it out. Attempting to catch the booster at the tower. This would be the second tower catch. Booster landing, landing first door. See it, 13 engines. Booster now hovering as it aligns with the tower for catch. Booster coming in. Down Get ready to, for that boom, Kate. Down to three engines. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time today. We have a little bit of fireside. Kind of makes sense, right? I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking tech, talking photo, talking video today. We're going to be talking about SpaceX Starship. Boom. Well, it was a success and a failure at the exact same time. And that's the difference between NASA and SpaceX. SpaceX wants to fail so that they can learn quicker and iterate faster and then finally innovate and make things anew. Well, there was a lot of innovation that happened on this Starship and I think something there is what caused the explosion, the failure. Now, Super Heavy did come back to us and landed absolutely perfect, just like with IFT-5. Perfect landing. Well, the Starship was not so lucky. And I want to get into some of it as far as what we believe is the case, um, why this happened. And then before the end of this video, I'm going to show you some live footage that one of you, one of the great members of this channel sent to me last night, right off the coast of an island, the Turks and Caicos, on a yacht right overhead, the Starship explodes. Kind of scary, but it is a beautiful, beautiful fireworks show. So I'm going to show that to you before the end of this video. Now, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what they were doing and why I personally think that this happened and getting all of the information that's so far disseminated out. To start out with, there was a lot going on with this Ship 33. There was a lot of innovation, a lot of changes. Number one, they changed the flaps completely. Instead of flaps being opposing to each other, 180 degrees, they pulled those flaps in about 120 degrees apart. So they were on the leeward side. All right, the dorsal side of the craft. So when it came in, or eventually came in, which it never did because it exploded, but if it came in, those fins would be out of that plasma that would be pouring off it, right? Because it would be more towards that top dorsal side or the leeward side, not affected as much by that heat. Now the fins were 25% smaller, but they were also thinner. They didn't get to test those out, nor did they get to test out the new heat shielding. Now, they did have some heat shielding that was active cooling in comparison to passive cooling. Passive cooling is what you would see with a ceramic tile where it passively dissipates the heat. Active cooling is something like you have with your computer. All right, where you have something that's highly conductive of heat attached to the CPU, and then you have a fan blowing on it, active, or running liquid through it, liquid cooling of the CPU. Same type of thing. I believe they were doing some type of liquid cooling here, but once again, they didn't get to test that out. Now, they were also going to test placing 10 dummy SpaceX Starlink version 3s into space by opening up that Pez dispenser, the little door, and shooting them out like Pez. They didn't get to do that either. So there was a lot going on here. But I think the biggest thing was the fact that they increased the size, the capacity, the load of the propellant 25%, not a little bit. It's a lot of it. All right. And in so doing, they actually stretched the craft by, I think it's 1.8 meters or somewhere around there. But it is definitely taller, definitely larger. So once again, 25% more fuel. Now, the problem 
as we see it as of right now, because we saw flames kind of coming out of the rear or the lower fins, or the lower flaps, we can actually see some flames. So we know that there was a fire right around that area. That fire should not have been there. The fire should be below it, obviously in the engine bay, okay? Now the thought here is, is that the tank or a valve stuck or a line broke, something in this new area ended up spewing out oxygen and fuel. And at that time, remember, they have safety measures to dissipate that, to vent out. But those venting systems could only handle a specific PSI, maybe 10 PSI, 20 PSI, 25 PSI, something like that. Well, if this was a major leak, that compartment, all right, would experience hundreds of PSI, which it could not handle. When I was researching this, I found out that they have like a firewall in between the engine bay and then a cavity and then the fuel, right? And they have a bulkhead between that, the fueling tanks. So there is some type of firewall, but according to my information, that firewall is about four millimeters thick. It seemed a little bit thin when I was reading this also. Why would you have a firewall that's four millimeters thick? Stainless steel. Now remember, they are using good stainless steel. They're using 304 or they're using 316 stainless steel, which is aircraft grade, obviously. And I looked up the temperatures. This stainless steel, let's say they're using 316 because 316 is really anti-corrosive. So they're probably using that. It does have a slightly higher maximum heating, let's say. Now, before that type of stainless melts, it needs to hit about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit or what is it like 1,375 centigrade. So it's hot. But the problem with that is, is that's melting. We don't need melting to happen, right? We need some type of warping or instability or structural integrity that ended up being compromised. You can definitely get warping of even 316 at as low as 800 degrees Celsius in comparison to close to 1400. So the other thing is, is sustained heat will definitely lower the temperature that is required before that instability happens, that structural integrity is compromised. So it could have something to do with that. It could simply be that it wasn't able to vent the amount of fuel that was pouring out of the damn thing fast enough. And it just built up pressure and more and more and more pressure until it ignited and exploded. That's a possibility too. The other possibility is that heat ended up rendering the engines non-functional because we saw during the flight, we saw the engines start going out one of the inner engines and then an outer engine and then another inner engine, another outer. And at that point, I was saying on the live, I'm like, look, if those gimbling engines go out, the three in the center, you're pretty much screwed because those are the, the engines that are used later after the fact to be able to guide and land the vessel in a specific location. So that craft will come in and those engines will gimbal to get it to drop to the exact spot. The same thing holds true with Super Heavy. How that was caught with Mechazilla, it came in, it ignited all 13 engines to slow down, shut off those and only left the three gimbling engines, the ones that are mobile, to be able to get it to land specifically on a dot on Mechazilla's arms to be caught. So the same thing holds true with the Starship. So when we saw that those engines started going out, I knew that there was a problem. And then it was at 825 when telemetry stopped. There was nothing more coming through. I said, that's it. It was over. And that's normally the case. And the reason being is that there is three forms of telemetry going on. So you got the SpaceX Starlink stuff. You have two others that are constantly in contact. So telemetry will be going and going and going. Even if something else failed, one of the three failed, or even two of the three failed, you would still have telemetry. When telemetry stops like that, most likely the vessel is gone. All right because there is redundancy to that telemetry. There is redundant backups to the aviation computers, to everything, there is redundancy. When it comes to anything aerospace, there is 
two of everything, sometimes three of everything. As they say, one is none, two is one. So a lot of times they'll have tertiary, they'll have three backups of everything. So in the end, what caused the RUD or rapid unscheduled disassembly, boom, was most likely the fueling system. So it could have been a valve, it could have been a line, something having to do with this new capacity, this 25% more fuel. Once again, larger tanks, they probably had to move things around a little bit. And in so doing, maybe when they moved the piping around, it got to a location that experiences a lot of vibration, let's say, and it came loose, or maybe there was a valve that got stuck or something. But either way, there was a ton of fuel expelling from that cavity. And it is believed that there was not enough venting to prevent that explosion from happening. Once again, 20 PSI, 30 PSI is nothing when you hit 100, 200 plus PSI. It just can't hold that. And then eventually once it ignites, it's kind of game over anyways. So let me bring up the video so you can see what this looks like. At the time of the explosion, you can see the just immense firework display. Now remember, this video is from overhead of a yacht that was sitting there parked, once again, in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And this is live footage from last night or from yesterday afternoon, which once again, one of you, a fantastic member of this channel sent to me. So this is actually what they saw overhead. So this isn't like a hundred miles away. This is right above them. So it's kind of scary if you think about it because you don't know how many pieces of this is going to fall into the ocean or possibly fall on your head. <laughs> because remember, this stainless steel, it holds up pretty damn well. There is going to be a lot of debris falling into the ocean for certain. Now, there was articles I was reading. It's like, oh, the FAA said not to go in this location because there's an explosion. And that, that's all a bunch of nonsense. Don't believe any of that. Because this area was already a warning area, an area with high alert where planes couldn't go into anyways, all right? So all of that nonsense is sensationalized. You know how it goes, right? You have to kind of take everything with at least a tiny bit, a pinch of salt, maybe a pound of salt these days. But anyways, I digress. In the end, this was a success. They were able to see that the Super Heavy was able once again to land on the Mechazilla arms, on these little pins. It's just crazy how it can even do it, but land perfectly. They also used a, at least one or two engines from IFT-5 here on IFT-7 and they worked. There was one of the 13 engines that didn't light back up and then once they did relight it for the second time, it came back online. So there could have been a glitch with that specific engine. They will know if that is one of the older engines or if it was a new engine, stuff like that's gonna happen. But like I said during the live, when the 13 engines come on to Super Heavy and start slowing the craft down, it doesn't matter if there's 12 engines or 11 engines, it is enough. Trust me, those Raptor engines can do it. So if you have one or two that are not lit on the outer periphery, you're okay. But once again, if one of those gimbling three engines in the center go out, well, now you're having a problem when it comes to guidance and be able to get it to touch down exactly where you want it to touch down. Anyways, I wanna know what you think about all of this. Elon Musk said it is a major success. He's kind of upset about not being able to test out the heat shielding as well as the Pez dispenser. So going on to the next one, IFT8, he said that, listen, this is not going to stop us from launching next month. We're gonna launch IFT8 next month. So I'm excited for that, okay? Because that means everything that was learned yesterday is going to be implemented in IFT8. Most likely it's gonna have a lot to do with the fueling because the fueling was definitely an issue, number one. And number two, we don't wanna see any of those candles go out. But I'm gonna to venture to say that there was a lot going on that we're not gonna know about for the next couple of days, maybe a week. But boiling it all down, most of it, I would say 90% chance has to do with the fueling system and their new tank with 25% more capacity, rerunning of lines or something that has changed that they weren't thinking about, they weren't aware of that it would be a fault 
point. Well, now they know and they will fix it. And once again, like I said at the beginning of this video, that's the difference between NASA and Elon Musk SpaceX. SpaceX will take 10 months where NASA will take 10 years. The same thing holds true with Jeff Bezos and his new Glenn. It took them 10 years from 2015 to just a couple of days ago when Blue Origin launched the new Glenn, once again, into orbit for the first time ever. 10 years, guys, 10 years. So what say you? Down below, I want to hear your thoughts. If you enjoyed the video, throw it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not. If you are, I appreciate that. Click this notification button here so when I go live when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. If you want to say thank you for all of my hard work on this channel, there's a thank you button here. You can give a dollar or two if you like. If not, it's perfectly fine. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better. If you want to take a look at any of my eBooks, they're free. Just for you being here, go to jchristina.com forward slash books. Once again, jchristina.com forward slash books. And if you want more Starlink content, over the last 40 plus months, I've put together 400 videos just for you. I'll put a link right here. You can click on it now if you want. I put a link right here. Helpful how-tos, tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what to buy, what not to buy, and the why behind all of those 400 plus videos. So guys, thank you so much for being here yesterday all five six hundred plus of you thank you for being here today let me finalize with head over to my website jchristina.com where you can find all the photography tools i've invented for you and me over the many years and my merch and my teas and my books and everything else once again check that out over at jchristina.com pick something up help support me and my family many blessings to you and your family stay safe stay healthy stay connected we'll see you in the next one take care guys